this upcoming Monday night, we begin marking Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the month of Av. And we, of course, have a fast day from Monday night until Tuesday night. And Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of Av, is the saddest day in the Jewish calendar. Temple, the first temple was destroyed on this day. The second temple was destroyed on this day. The edict expelling the Jews from Spain in 1492 was uh, to uh, take hold on the ninth day of Av. Uh, even in modern times, bad things are always happening on this day. Uh, for example, the liquidation of the ghetto, the Warsaw ghetto in 1943 also happened in this day. And our sages tell us that this is a day that is designated for tragedy. The spies in the book of Numbers, when Moshe sends out spies to go scout out the land of Israel, and they come back and they tell a bad report about the land, the land is bad, the land is dangerous, the land is unconquerable, we can't prevail, let's go back to Egypt. And everyone's crying that night, and of course they're crying needlessly, because if you have God on your, on your side, nothing is unconquerable, and if God tells you the land is good, and the land is flowing with milk and honey, and that's where the best place for you to be, and this is the legacy of, of Abraham, and this is our land, and God promises that we'll conquer it, there's nothing wrong, and there's no reason to cry. And because that day was Tisha B'av, and the Jewish people were crying needlessly, therefore, it is a day that is forever designated for real crying. If you want to cry for no reason... God will tell you, okay, you want to cry? I'll give you a reason to cry. And we're told that the second temple was destroyed because the Jewish people did not have the merits needed for it to be maintained. And the Talmud tells us, very famously, that the second temple was destroyed because of sinas chinam, of baseless hatred of one Jew to the other. And therefore, Uh, when we're approaching this solemn and this sad day, it's important for us to try to focus on the meaning behind the day and specifically try to find ways of fostering love of one Jew to another Jew. If that was the undoing of the temple, it is the key for its rebuilding. And again, our sages tell us, that every generation, of every generation that the temple was not rebuilt, it is as if it was destroyed. So our efforts to try to, quote-unquote, rebuild the temple are not just that we could gain a temple, it's almost as if we could lose the temple by not rebuilding it. And therefore, during this time, it's a tradition uh, to try to rectify the causes of the destruction by focusing uh, on integrating the keys of positive interpersonal relationships, and thus bridging the gap between us and our fellow, trying to create ways to love our fellow as ourselves, to create channels of positivity between one Jew and another, and hopefully to fix the core problem uh, that led to the destruction of the temple, and hopefully be an asset towards its rebuilding, may it happen speedily in our days. And I was thinking that uh, in the spirit of trying to work on matters between one man and and his fellow, to look at a particular mitzvah, maybe one that's not discussed often enough, a mitzvah that relates to how two people relate to each other, and to try to find a way to, to, to analyze it, to study it, to examine it, and to learn its principles and try to integrate those lessons into our life and improve the way we treat others. The verse tells us in the book of Vayikra in Leviticus, in chapter 19, a very famous chapter because it has several verses after the verse that we're going to discuss. It's the most famous verse of all Torah, love your fellow as yourself, the golden rule, the rule that was hijacked and plagiarized by all the other religions, a few verses prior to that verse, love your fellow as yourself, it says, Lo sisna es achicha bilvavecha. Do not hate your fellow in your heart. 
Hocheach tochiach samisecha. You should surely rebuke your fellow. Velosisa alav chet. You should not bear a sin for him. That's the verse immediately prior to the verse that tells us to love your fellow as yourself. And here we see a mitzvah in the Torah. When you see someone else misbehaving, sinning, doing misdeeds, it is a mitzvah to critique, to critique him or her, to rebuke, to guide the person who is sinning back to the path of righteousness. Moreover, we're told that if someone does not critique the misdeeds of others, they are complicit and they have a part in those sins. The Talmud goes as far as saying that if someone is in a position of rectifying the sins of others and doesn't, not only are they culpable, but they're even more guilty than the sinner themselves. If I can fix someone else's sin, can prevent it, and I don't, I rest on my laurels, I'm complacent, I stand idly while they're sinning, I could have stopped them and I didn't, I'm more guilty than they are. Talmud tells us that uh, the Almighty appointed an angel to go destroy sinners. And then he appointed a second angel to go and make black marks on the foreheads of tzaddikim, of the righteous who didn't sin, and thus to tell the angel that's going to vanquish the sinners, don't touch the people that have the black mark on their forehead because they're, they're righteous and they didn't sin. And comes along the persecuting angel and says, now, wait, 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 wait a minute. Why are these tzaddikim, these people who haven't sinned, why, are, why do they get off scot-free? They could have rectified everyone else by criticizing them, by rebuking them, by giving constructive criticism of being mochiach, of directing them back to good, and therefore they're guilty. And they might have accepted the claim of this persecuting angel, and indeed, he tells the angel, the, 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 the original angel with the, with, the, with the pencil who's making the march in the foreheads, don't make a black mark on their foreheads of the tzaddikim, make a red mark. And then the angel who's going to mete out the punishment, he told, when you go and have the plague hitting the people and you see someone who has a red mark on his forehead, he gets attacked first. This Gemara teaches us that not only is it a good thing and an obligation for us to redirect someone who is on a wayward path back to the proper one, it's a responsibility that we cannot shirk, and it's a responsibility that if we do not fulfill it properly, we are guilty with all the other people's sins. And you can think about it this way. You suppose someone is really fastidious and assiduous in making sure that they don't sin. Everything they do, they first think, well, is this the right thing to do? Is this the wrong thing to do? What does the Almighty want? What does the Torah say? And they really focus on cleansing their character and their behavior. Well, that's the right thing to do. They're at Santit. They're righteous. They're clean. Their slate is perfectly righteous. And then they get to heaven, and they take a look at their scorecard, and they see all these sins. Oh, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I didn't. That's not me. And they'll tell him, wait a minute. Maybe that wasn't you personally, but you were quiet when others were doing it. You could have stopped it, and you didn't. Now they're on your ledger. Of course, that's a terrifying thought, but indeed, that's what the Talmud intimates is actually happening. So this is a mitzvah of criticizing, critiquing other people for their misdeeds. And I also think it's something that uh, we feel, you know, that it's a, it's, 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 it's a virtuous way of virtue signaling when someone sees someone else behaving in a way that they don't behave. And there's a certain pleasure and joy and a delight that we get 
when we say and point out, look at you. I don't do that. I don't behave in that way. And I could look and castigate and denigrate you for being such an evil person, being a sinner. And there's a certain relish that a person gets by highlighting the misdeeds of others, especially while contrasting it to his personal good deeds, good character, good behavior. And what I want to do today is to try to distinguish what is the correct way, what is the necessary and vital way of performing this mitzvah, and what is the incorrect way of doing it. Because it's possible to criticize in a way that's a mitzvah and is a necessary activity, and it's possible to criticize in a way that is a sin. And I want to just clarify uh, what these two ways are. And coincidentally, this week's parsha is Devarim, Deuteronomy, the first parsha, first session of Deuteronomy. And it begins with a, with a speech from Moshe, a speech of reproval uh, of Moshe to the nation uh, a couple of weeks before he dies. And I think if you analyze the speech that Moshe gives, you get a masterclass of how to criticize others in the way that's the mitzvah. And I think, you know, not only as, as Jews who are trying to hearken to Torah, I think it's also a vital skill in life. You know, if you're a leader of any kind, you're a parent to a child, you're a boss to employees, you're a leader of any kind, you're going to need to learn how to give constructive criticism. And to to do it, you have to have a certain skill. And... As a Jew, of course, we know that it's a mitzvah, so we have to learn this skill anyhow, but it's also broadly applicable elsewhere in life. And I think it's worthwhile, especially given that it's this week's parsha, and that it's, uh, we're, you know, we're in the run-up to Tisha B'Av to learn a bit about how to rebuke effectively. I want to begin with a Talmud in the book of Yavamos. The Talmud says a very, very quizzical statement. Rabbi Eliyah, Rabbi Ilaa, the son, said in the name of Rabbi Lazar Bar Shimon. Of course, the Talmud always attributes a teaching to whom, uh, to which great rabbi said it. Kishem she mitzvah adam lomar davar hanishma, just like it's a mitzvah for a person to say something that will be accepted. So too, it's a mitzvah for him to say some to not say something which is not accepted. So when speaking about the mitzvah of hocher tochich esamisecha, of you should surely rebuke your fellow, the Talmud tells us, if it is something that will be accepted, it's a mitzvah to say it. But just as it's a mitzvah to say something that will be accepted, it's a mitzvah to withhold from saying something that will not be accepted. And there's a few obvious questions. We're told that it's a mitzvah to say something. And we're told it's mitzvah to not say something. It seems kind of strange that saying something and not saying something are both mitzvahs. Moreover, uh, on the second side, to to, to not say something that will not be said, it's a mitzvah. How how could not doing something be a mitzvah? You're you're not saying something. How how is that a mitzvah? Uh, Perhaps the Talmud could have said, if something, if your rebuke will not be accepted, don't say it. Or you're not obligated to say it. Here it says it's a mitzvah to not say something which won't be said. I think the the, the, the term it's a mitzvah is somewhat puzzling. And indeed, the whole notion of not saying something that won't be heard, of not rebuking in a way that will not be accepted, it, it seems... Uh, to imply that it's possible for me to know whether or not someone else will accept. Doesn't the other person have free will to accept my words or not? How am I, before I criticize someone, before I consider criticizing, I have to ask myself the question, says the Talmud. I have to ask myself, will this criticism be accepted? If yes, it's a mitzvah. Will this criticism not be accepted? Then it's a sin. And I should not say it. And it's a mitzvah for me not to say it. Am I a prophet? Am I a guru? Do I know the future? Am I a fortune teller? How am I supposed to know if the other person who has his own free will will accept it or not? 
How does the Talmud say, well, you have to know beforehand whether they will accept it? How am I supposed to know? Maybe the person is inclined to accept it, maybe not. Those are several questions on the Talmud itself. However, there's another question. It seems to me that there's another Talmud in the book of Baba Mitzi on page 31 that says something which is directly in contradiction to the Talmud of Yavamas. Talmud of Yavamas says, if a person will not accept it, it's a mitzvah not to say it. Says the Talmud in Baba Mitzia, Hocheach tochiach es you should surely rebuke, and in Hebrew repeats it twice, rebuke, rebuke, afilu mea pa'amim, even a hundred times. That's what the Talmud says. You have to rebuke someone even hundred. You try once, it doesn't work, try again, even a hundred times. Don't stop trying. That seems to be directly in conflict with what Rabbi Elazar said in the, in the Talmud of Amos. In the Talmud of Amos, it says, if the person will not accept it, don't say it. And here we're told, if the person doesn't accept it, say it again, say it again, say it again, even a hundred times until they accept it. Be persistent. If it doesn't work once, try it again. If it doesn't work twice, try it again. If it doesn't work 99 times, try a hundredth time. Wait a minute. I thought if it's not going to be accepted, it's a mitzvah not to even say it once. How do these seemingly opposing Talmudic teachings, how are they reconciled? What I want to suggest is an answer that seems to answer all the questions. What I want to suggest is that it's not that there's a certain content of criticism or certain individual that is inclined to accept or reject my criticism. Rather, there is one method of criticism that's a mitzvah and that will be accepted, and there's another method of criticism that's a sin and that invariably will not be accepted. I see someone else misbehaving, doing a sin, going in their improper path. There's two ways for me to deal with this situation, i.e. there's two ways for me to criticize them. There's one where I see someone and they're misbehaving and I point out with detail, with precision, exactly what they're doing wrong. And I triumph over them. Look at me. I'm great, I pointed out your misdeeds, and you're a terrible person. That's one kind of criticism. And then there's another kind of criticism, which is actually going to invoke that person to change their behavior. It's constructive criticism. When the Torah tells you, give constructive criticism, what this means, it's a mitzvah because it will work. And because you're doing it in the proper way, that it guaranteed to work. Denigrating, castigating, ripping down a person without a constructive purpose, that's a sin. Says the Talmud, just like it's a mitzvah to say criticism that will be accepted, i.e. say it in the method that will work, that's a mitzvah. So too it's a mitzvah to not say something that it won't work. What this means is it's not that the person will accept it, the person will not accept it. It means there's, a, there, there's two ostensibly similar things, criticism, one of them is a mitzvah, one of them is a sin. Well, how does not doing something be a sin? Well, there's precedent for it. If there is a sin that is available and something that is desirous and something that makes you feel good by sinning and you withhold from it, that's a mitzvah. Thus, the Talmud is not saying do something or not do something, and those are the same thing. It's saying, do one thing and don't do the other thing. Do criticism in a way that it's a mitzvah, and don't do criticism in a way that it's a sin. And these are separate ways of doing things. And we're also told a tremendous insight. If you do it in the proper way, if you do it in the constructive way, it will be heard. If you do it in the bad way, in the way that manifests your negative character, makes you feel good for triumphing over someone who's lesser than you, they're weaker than you, they're worse of a person than you are, that won't work no matter what. And you have to try to withhold for that and and, and that's a mitzvah. Moreover, 
the Talmud in Baba Metzia tells you that you have to reprove even a hundred times. That does not mean that you're doing it in the incorrect manner and the person is not listening to you the first time because you did it wrong. No. What this is showing you that sometimes constructive criticism cannot be delivered in one fell swoop. You can't just lather, layer, layer it all on at once. Sometimes you may even need to break up your criticism into a hundred different parts. And the first part, when it didn't work, is because it was never intended to work in one part because sometimes a person is not ready to accept it all at once. Sometimes you'll need to take whatever criticism you want to give in a constructive way, in the way that it's a mitzvah, break it down into small little pieces, and that is the effective way of getting the person to change. And that's what you need to do if you want to do it properly. And that's indeed a mitzvah. Thus, when the Talmud tells us that you have to do it even a hundred times, it doesn't mean that the first time it didn't work and you're trying the same thing the second time and you'll keep on trying until it works. No, it means that this is the way to do it the way that will be accepted by breaking it up into smaller parts and gradually, one bit at a time, bring the person back to your way of doing things. So what I want to do here is I want to understand what exactly are these two different ways of giving criticism and what's the proper way of doing it. And I want to take lessons from the greatest man that ever lived, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, our teacher, and how he dispenses criticism to the Jewish people. The book of Devarim begins with a speech that Moshe gives to the Jewish people. And the first section, the first thing that he says, and we're going to go with Rashi, Rashi's understanding of the beginning of Devarim, it's all a complete critique of the Jewish people as a whole. More about that in a little bit. And it's really done in a strange way, not in a way that you would expect. And I think by deconstructing how he did it, we could pull out some core lessons of how to do it properly. So I want to begin, incidentally, with verse number three. Verse number three tells us when this happened. It was in the 40th year, on the 11th month of the first day of the month, i.e. from the Exodus. So we know that the Jewish people left in Nisan, and this is in in uh, in Shvat. So this is two months short of exactly 40 years since the Jewish people left. Moshe is going to die in the seventh day of Adar, which is the 12th month. So this is exactly 37 days before Moshe is dying, and he's speaking to the people. So why is it significant for us to be told exactly which date this is and that it's right before the death of Moshe? Says Rashi, this is coming to teach us that Moshe did not criticize the Jewish people only right before he was dying, right before his death, right before his passing. Moshe waited until he was on his, so to speak, deathbed. Everyone knows this is the end of the line for Moshe. And then he criticized them. And how did he know to do it at this time? He learned a lesson from Jacob. At the end of Genesis, at the end of Bereshis, Jacob is about to die. What does he do? He gathers all his children, his sons, and he gives them a blessing. And some of them, if you read the story... Notably, Reuven, Shimon, and Levi, the three eldest sons, he actually gives them very harsh criticism of events that happened decades earlier. Why does Jacob, if he wants to criticize Reuven and Shimon and Levi, why does he wait so long before dispensing it? Obviously, he wanted to wait till before he died. Says Moshe, I want to copy Jacob. If Jacob awaited till before his death to give criticism, I'm going to do the same. Why? Why is it so important to await until before someone dies to give criticism? Says Rashi that Jacob reasoned, why did I not critique Reuven all these years so that Reuven should not abandon me and go join the tribe of Esau, my brother, of Esau, my brother. 
And additionally, says Rashi, there's four reasons why a person does not criticize others only before he dies. Number one, to not criticize him multiple times. If you criticize him, you know, 30 years ago, and then it's been 30 years since, it's possible that over the time you'll continue to do it. Well, if it's before you die, that's it. This is the end of the line for you. You'll criticize him once, and you shouldn't criticize him twice. Number one, you should not see him or be continually embarrassed. If, if, if a, you know, if a person criticizes another person, they're invoking other person's misdeeds. Every time they meet, there's a little bit of, a sh- of shame where the person who was critiqued has to see the person who honestly and truthfully brought up misdeeds in their behavior. That's not comfortable. You don't want to make someone uncomfortable. To not harbor ill will. And lastly, to not that they, sh- that they should not abandon him. They should not cause alienation. And this, I think, is a really shocking idea. Jacob was worried that Ruvain... If he was criticized by Jacob, he would actually leave and join Esau. That's an astonishing idea. Jacob was worried that he would lose his son to his brother, to his sinful, terrible, evil, wicked brother Esau, just on the bats in the wake of criticizing him. What this shows us, and this really shows us the danger of it, is that criticism breeds alienation. Jacob, if he criticizes Reuven, Reuven might leave. Reuven might abandon him. And that's how serious it is. And that's why we have to approach it very delicately. We have to make sure that when we criticize someone else, we're not alienating them. And additionally here, to not criticize multiple times, we think that we're so on top of our character and our, and our, and our thoughts and our actions and we remember everything. But the truth is we don't. And if I criticize someone once and I do it again, that person says, hmm, this person already criticized me on this and he's doing it again. Must be. He doesn't have my intention, my best interest in mind. If he did, he would have known that he told this to me already once. He's just trying to do the other kind of criticism, which is bad character. And of course, that kind of criticism doesn't work. And that, again, will breed alienation. So this shows us just a, a, a disclaimer Uh, a caveat, that while it's a mitzvah to do it and it's an indispensable mitzvah and it's a very powerful, potent tool, it's also a very dangerous and volatile one. And therefore, we have to do it correctly. So what does Moshe do? Let's deconstruct Moshe's criticism of the nation to learn a few important lessons that apply to this mitzvah. So the the, the first Rashi in the entire book tells us that Moshe is critiquing the people, but he's doing it in a way that he's allowing their honor to be preserved. He's allowing them to save face. And this, of course, immediately teaches us that when someone is critiqued, they are under assault. And when they're under assault, they get defensive. And when they get defensive, they're not going to accept what is being told to them because they're immediately going to try to either lash out or defend themselves. And of course, if a person is not willing to accede to the fact that there's something wrong in their character, how will they ever face up to it and fix it? And of course, if that's the only goal. So when someone is dispensing, is is on the giving end of the critique and they want it to work, they have to be very keenly aware that they have to do it in a skillful, skillful, maybe circuitous manner that it doesn't confront the other person's instinct of mounting defenses. So what does Moshe do? Then, then the first verse, you just read it simply. It seems like it's a very strange verse. These are the words of Moshe that Moshe spoke to all of Israel on the other side of the Jordan in the wilderness, in the plains, opposite the Sea of Reeds, between Paran, between Tophel, and Lavan, and Chatzirot, and Dizahav. If you read that verse, just quite simply, just translate it, it doesn't sound, it sounds like a very strange thing. First of all, the plains, that's where they were right now. You read in the Book of Numbers, they settled in the plains of Moab, which is on the eastern bank of the Jordan River. And plains, well, that, by definition, means that there is grass and trees and whatnot, 
and a desert means that it's barren. So how could Moshe be speaking to them in the plains, in the desert? Those are opposite. Those are different locations. Also, uh, the Sea of Reeds is all the way south by Egypt. And Tophel and Lavan and Chatzir, these places don't even exist. Where is Moshe speaking to them? So Rashi tells us is that what Moshe is actually doing here is Moshe is invoking the various times that the Jewish people over their history have sinned. When it says, Be'ever uh, Hayardin, on the other side of the Jordan, well, that's really where they were. However, when it talks about Bamidbar in the wilderness, that's referring to a sin the Jewish people did in the wilderness when they said, if only we could die. And why did God bring us out of Egypt? And then when it mentions in the plains, it's referring to the sins with the, of, with the idols due to the daughters of Moab. And then when it talks about Mul Suf, opposite the splitting of the sea, opposite the Sea of Reeds, which split, that's when they complained 40 years prior, seven days after they left Egypt, they were surrounded on all sides, and they told Moshe, are there insufficient graves in Egypt? You took us out here just to kill us here? Well, we could have died in Egypt just as easily. And then when it talks about Ben Parano, Ben Tofel, Velavan, Vechatzerot, Vedizahav, these are all invoking various sins. The sin of the manna, what they did in Paran with the sin of the spies, right? Sin of the manna is when they complained about the manna, right? Oh, it's a terrible, it's, it's terrible food. It's, it's going to make us bloated. We're going to explode because we don't have to pass any waste. Chatzay wrote that reference to the sin of Korach's rebellion, Korach's mutiny, or that they didn't listen to what happened. They didn't hearken and heed to the lessons of Miriam when Miriam spoke negatively about her brother and she was punished and the people continued to gossip. And lastly, Dizahav is the sin of the golden calf. Thus, Moshe is actually invoking all the sins that he wants to criticize the Jewish people about. But how does he do it? He does it very subtly. He hints it. He mentions places that you have to extrapolate and pull the lesson. He is not making a full frontal attack on the nation. He is going in a very subtle and veiled and concealed way. And moreover, verse number two. It's 11 days from Choreb through the way of Mount Seir until Kaddish Barnea. Again, a very strange verse. And Rashi tells us this continues the veiled criticism. It was 11 days from Choreb, which is Mount Sinai, to Kaddish Barnea. Now, actually, Rashi does the mathematics for us. In the actual story, when they traveled, it took him three days. But what Moshe is telling them is that without their sins, they would have hip stop and a, 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 a hop, step and a jump, or skip and jump from Egypt is Israel. If you actually look on a map and look where Egypt is and look where Israel is, where Canaan is, they're very close to each other on the map. And, and Moshe is telling us is that it was 11 day journey. That's nothing. It's a week and a half. Well, why did we... Why did it take 40 years to travel from here to there? Only due to the sin of the Jewish people. Now, what's even more surprising about this, this again, that's another veiled criticism. Your sins led to all this, all these problems. Well, it's also interesting. Moshe does not mention how many days it actually took, only how many days it would be estimated to take. And thus, Moshe is, again, not in a direct manner, but in a uh, circuitous manner, Moshe is telling them, your sins led you to this uh, predicament. And finally, verse 4 tells us that this is after they had smitten Sihon, the king of Emor, and Od, the king of Bashan, who were the twin towers, the mighty empires that the Jewish people just recently defeated. And Moshe is telling, and, and Rashi tells us that what Moshe is doing there is Moshe is pointing out the fact that he's actually done a lot of good for the, for the Jewish people. Why? If Moshe had just criticized them and not, they would say, what would they say? Who is this? What's he done for us? What's he done for us lately? Why is he criticizing us? And what this shows us is that the natural reaction that a person has to someone else critiquing them is saying, this person is 
doing something for their own benefit to feel good about themselves, not for my benefit. They don't have my best interests in mind. Had Moshe just critiqued the Jewish people randomly at any given time, the people would have said, what has he done for us? He's done nothing for us, and he's only doing stuff for himself, including this criticism. Thus, Moshe waited until they had vanquished their enemies and the enemies that everyone was quaking in their boots from, everyone was scared of Sihon and Od. These were the two empires with mighty armies. Moshe defeats them. Moshe made sure that our families and our wives and children and our nation is safe and free and clear from our enemies. Only after he demonstrates his value to us and then we know for sure he has our best interest in mind, then he could criticize us. Because then we cannot say, oh, this is just Moshe acting in his best interest. What this shows us to really help someone else go back to the path of good, they have to know unequivocally that we have their best interest in mind. And therefore, unless it's, totally been impressed upon them that I am trying to help you because I love you and I care for you and I want what's best for you. If if there's any doubt about that, criticism will fall flat on its face. It won't work. That's the negative kind of criticism that doesn't work and indeed is a sin and we must withhold from it. Just an example of how this may work. Parent and a child. So, of course, as a parent, you know, your job as a parent is to educate your child and to direct your child to the positive way that they do mitzvahs, that they behave, they become a good person, they, they become responsible. Of course, that, that's the job of a parent. Well, sometimes there is another motivation for a parent, a parent to be motivated because their child is misbehaving, and they're embarrassed. And they lash out at their child. Why are you misbehaving? And the child knows that this is not because the parent has their interest in mind. It's because the, i.e., it's not because the parent has the child's best interest in mind, rather because the parent is embarrassed from his friends. Or the parent's envious of the neighbor's kids. Look how well they behave. Why can't my kids behave like that? And thus I criticize them and try to redirect them. That's not going to work. The recipient of my critique, of my rebuke, has to be so keenly aware of the fact that I love them and I'm doing this for them and for no other reason, that's the only way it's going to work. If the person can interpret the rebuke, the reproval, the pointing out of the misdeeds in any way other than the person who is giving that really wants the best for me, It's not going to work. Moshe waits until he single-handedly, or at least from the perspective of the Jewish people, he leads them to victory against mighty empires. Then he has a window to point out their misdeeds. I want to point out another, another, another insight here. These people are the children of the people who actually did those sins. Because most of these things that Moshe is pointing out happen at the very beginning of the 40 years. And over these past 40 years, that generation filtered out and there's a new generation in town. So Moshe is actually criticizing them not for their own sins, but for the sins of their fathers. And still Moshe treads so carefully. Still Moshe is tiptoeing and being so wary to make sure that he does not, he goes through the circuitous, circuitous way and he makes sure he points out their mis- the, 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 how much he does for them and he waits till before he's going to die and he doesn't say it twice. All the things that we see about how Moshe critiques them still applies even when he's not critiquing them per se for their behavior, only for their father's behavior. And the reason why is even, certainly when I receive criticism, I recoil and I respond and I lash back, certainly when a person himself receives that, but even when a person hears criticism of their forebearers, they respond and they lash back and they defend. And if Moshe was so careful to not attack 
in a direct way the misdeeds of the fathers of the Jewish people, how much more so when you want to point out the misdeeds of a person themselves? So we learned uh, a, a fair bit about how to critique other people. It's a mitzvah, it's an uh, indispensable, so we cannot shirk from it. However, there's two ways of doing it. There's one way of doing it which will not be heard, and that's a sin. And there's a way of doing it that will be hurt. Sometimes it means doing it a hundred times, but it certainly means thinking very deeply beforehand, how do I know the person recognizes that I have their best interest in mind? How do I do it in a way that they don't respond defensively? How do I not embarrass them in any way? How do I do it in a way that will be accepted, that they'll know that I have their best interest in mind? Maybe I should hide it. Maybe I should uh, delay it, wait till later. Maybe I should... Do it in a in, in in a situation where I'm not directly pointing out the names of people. I'm speaking very in generalities, uh, like we see with the uh, Moshe mentions, mentions the sins of the sins of the spies a little bit later on in Deuteronomy and Dvarim. He doesn't mention any names. There's a there's a way of critiquing someone that's proper, but if you do it in the proper way, it's guaranteed to work. I think this is an a, a important lesson to maybe keep in mind uh, during this time of the year. We have responsibilities from us to our fellows. We cannot evade those responsibilities. We have to be cognizant of their feelings, allow them to save face, to work to promote their honor. And hopefully, you know, we'll take these lessons with us for Tisha B'Av. Hopefully, you know, today is Thursday before Tisha B'Av, if the temple is rebuilt before next Tuesday, it's going to be a day of celebration, not a day of mourning. Hopefully, it will be a day of celebration. But uh, regardless, this is the time to think about how we could work on our interpersonal behavior character. And may uh, we merit to see the rebuilding the temple speedily in our days, to improve the way we interact with other people, interpersonal relationships. As always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. Please subscribe to this podcast, to all the other podcasts. If you want to support the Torah that we are disseminating from our organization in Houston, Texas, all over the world, through podcasts and videos and all these other media, please visit our website. I have the link in the description of how you could support our education outreach efforts. Uh, Many, many of y'all have reached out and done and donated very generously, and we really, really appreciate that. Thanks for listening, and have a great rest of your day. All the best.